A dense canopy of trees towered overhead as a band slowly made their way through thick understory and stepped through leaf litter. Everyone was carrying something. At the front of the group, a woman held a satchel full of obsidian. Behind her, her son carried a mesh bag inside of which hung a small marsupial that was still alive. Others carried similar woven bags, some with live animals, others with yams, nuts, and dried fish. As the woman led her band through this unfamiliar forest, she searched for signs of human activity. She had not been to this island in three years, but as they had paddled their raft through the nearby ocean, they had spotted smoke rising from this forest, a sight the woman had been thankful to see after the journey from her home island. Leaving their raft and some supplies behind at the beach, the group entered the dense jungle, letting out warning shouts every few minutes. As she walked around the wide buttress root of a forest giant, the woman heard the greeting of a young man walking toward her. Dressed only in a few leaves, he smiled and waved at her to follow. His people had heard their shouts and had sent him out to guide them. As he brought them to a well-trodden path, dry and clear of shrubs and leaves, the woman felt her shoulders relax. The voyage had already lasted several days, She recalled the purpose behind this ordeal, to find a wife for her son among the bands of this neighboring island. Soon they walked into a camp, an area cleared of brush with a central fire surrounded by simple shelters with palm leaf roofs. The woman and her band were welcomed with smiles, dancing, and singing as was customary upon the arrival of travelers. Sharing food would follow, along with more festivities. Eventually, an exchange of gifts, including animals and obsidian, would take place, and more serious conversations would commence. This woman was part of a vibrant maritime culture that emerged on the Bismarck Archipelago, off the northeast coast of Sahul around 24,000 years ago. Travel between islands was common for these tropical hunter-gatherer fishers. Welcome to Our Prehistory, Episode 28, Last Glacial Maximum of Sahul. About 20,000 years after Homo sapiens colonized Sahul, temperatures on our planet dropped to the lowest since people arrived on this continent. The changing climate of this period, known as the Last Glacial Maximum, was felt by people living across Eurasia, Africa, and Sahul. We've already explored the dramatic and often devastating societal transformations in Europe caused by increasingly Arctic conditions. Today, we'll examine the impact of global cooling on the environment, human population, and cultural traditions of Sahul. In some cases, the response of humans to environmental change resembled that of the hunter-gatherers of Europe. However, across the tropical, arid, and temperate landscapes of Sahul, the human experience of the last glacial maximum was not universally one of suffering and challenge. The last glacial maximum was the most severe global cooling of the past 120,000 years. 
The exact timing and severity varied across the planet, but occurred roughly between 30,000 and 17,000 years ago. We know this from the ratio of oxygen isotopes in the ice of Greenland and Antarctica, and in mineral cave deposits from around the world. Global sea level dropped to its lowest point of the last glacial cycle between 26,500 and 19,000 years ago, when the land mass of Sahul grew to its largest extent and offered new coastal plains for humans to move into, especially off northwestern Australia, where the coast stood 100 to 300 kilometers north of its modern location. The cooling of Sahul was less drastic than in northern Europe, which had seen temperatures 15 degrees Celsius colder than today. Based on the identification of plant and insect species in geological sediments from this period, and the extent of their relocation across Sahul, it's estimated that the mountains of New Guinea were 6 degrees Celsius colder than today, and Australia ranged from 4 to 8 degrees colder. This drop in temperature was comparable to that of southern Europe at the time. Cooling impacted Sahul in various ways. One of these was the formation of glaciers in the mountain ranges of New Guinea, southeast Australia, and Tasmania. The largest glacier in the New Guinean highlands stretched across multiple mountain peaks and measured 3,400 square kilometers, although this was only 2% the size of the ice sheet covering the Alps. Furthermore, during the last glacial maximum, many Sahulian ecosystems underwent a transformation. These changes would have a much greater impact on human life than the growth of mountain glaciers. Pollen records show that many forests, woodlands, and savannas were replaced by less productive shrublands, arid grasslands, and deserts. In general, tree cover and vegetation declined. The cause of lower biological productivity is not completely understood, but is believed to be the result of a combination of factors, including less rainfall, lower temperatures, and less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. During the last glacial maximum, carbon dioxide levels were 30% lower than during the Holocene, and some parts of Sahul received less precipitation than today. This environmental shift started about 28,600 years ago and reached its most extreme between 23,000 and 19,000 years ago. In southeast Australia and Tasmania, grassland dominated, and temperate forests only survived on coastal margins. As vegetation died in the central arid zone, sand dune formation increased. Dust, picked up by the wind, was carried from the continent into the surrounding oceans. In northern tropical Australia, rainforest trees died and were replaced by more drought-tolerant species, like eucalyptus. Below the glaciers of New Guinea, mountaintop grasslands expanded as the tree line moved down the slopes. Below the tree line, Plant and animal species that today are only found in highland forests moved to lower elevations. Many of these environmental trends were only reversed around 17,700 years ago. So glacial conditions shaped human life on Sahul for more than 10,000 years. The influence of climate change emerges most clearly in the distribution of archaeological sites, which show that the geographic range of hunter-gatherers contracted. As woodlands transformed to grasslands, and grasslands to deserts, 
some bands were forced to migrate to places that still supported viable ecosystems. In the southern half of the continent, drinking water became harder to find, as rain fell less frequently. As a result, our species abandoned portions of Sahul during the peak of the Ice Age, especially in the arid central and western deserts of Australia. By the start of the last glacial maximum, foragers in this region had already lived for 10,000 years around oases with permanent water, and had probably produced the classic panoramity and archaic face petroglyphs. But then, starting 23,000 years ago, humans stopped traveling into the center of the continent for 4,000 years. A similar but shorter period of retreat is seen on the western coast and portions of eastern Australia. People stayed in areas where fresh water was still found, including the coasts and certain mountain ranges. Lands that had become hazardous to human survival were left behind, much like the abandonment of northern Europe during this period. In Europe, the last glacial maximum had been catastrophic for the human population, with a clear reduction in the number of archaeological sites and evidence of a genetic bottleneck in ancient European genomes. It had been a time of mass death. In Sahul, on the other hand, it's not as clear to what degree the peak of the Ice Age caused the human population to decline. Recent estimates based on the number of archaeological sites do not indicate a change in the number of people in Australia during the last glacial maximum. Furthermore, we don't have ancient DNA from this period of Sahulian prehistory, but the genes of living Papuans and Aboriginal Australians do not show signs of a genetic bottleneck around 20,000 years ago, something which geneticists believe they would be able to detect. In other words, based on the limited evidence from Suhul, it does not seem like the last glacial maximum was as detrimental to the human population as that of Europe. Some archaeologists suggest that in most regions of the continent, Sahulians were able to survive by moving to more favorable environments. Between 23,000 and 19,000 years ago, the people of Sahul were forced to retreat to refugia due to major environmental changes. However, based on the archaeological record, their customs don't seem to have changed much during this period. Stone tools remained mostly the same, dominated by simple flakes. Stone axes remained in use in northern Sahul and absent in the south. We see few major technological shifts, like the Gravedian to Salutrian in Europe around 26,000 years ago. Evidence that the hunter-gatherers of Sahul adapted to the changing conditions by altering their behavior is both rare and subtle. Cultural evolution among forager bands during the last glacial maximum is most evident in their patterns of mobility and exploitation of food resources. At several places across Australia that retained permanently flowing water, the intensity of human occupation increased between 23,000 and 19,000 years ago. At the edge of the arid zone, people retreated to watered gorges in the uplands of northern Australia and to the rivers and lakes of the Murray-Darling Basin in the southeast. It became riskier to travel far from these havens, so people spent more time where food and water remained reliably available. As a result, the ranges of many forager bands became less extensive. In northeast Australia, hunter-gatherers stopped transporting stone into a river gorge from outside sources, whereas under better environmental conditions, their more mobile descendants carried stone up to 70 kilometers. <laughs> 
A similar pattern of shorter transport distance of raw materials occurred at several other sites across the continent during the last glacial maximum. As people clung to smaller territories, some groups began to exploit a wider range of resources, often ignored under more favorable conditions. For example, around 22,400 years ago, people began using the Carpenter's Gap Rock Shelter in the Kimberley region of Northwest Australia much more frequently than they had before. Around this camp, people hunted animals like kangaroos, wallabies, and bilbies. But during the last glacial maximum, they relied more heavily on emu eggs and fish and mussels from a nearby river. An increased reliance on mussels is also seen along rivers in the northeast. In these cases, archaeologists view the collection of shellfish as a fallback for hunter-gatherers as larger animals became scarce. One of the few technological adaptations to the last glacial maximum occurred at the southern tip of Sahul in Tasmania, where the use of caves in the highlands reached its peak. These natural shelters provided protection from cold winters, but unlike today were surrounded by grasslands populated by red-necked wallabies, the favored cold-season prey of these people. Among these Tasmanian bands, stone thumbnail scrapers became popular during the last glacial maximum. These tools, used in part to work wallaby hides, had been invented here 10,000 years earlier. But around 22,000 years ago, as glaciers reached their largest extent in the uplands, thumbnail scrapers became ubiquitous in Tasmanian toolkits. At the coldest time, in the coldest region of Sahul, people made a rare innovation in stone tool technology. Another example of human adaptation to environmental change comes from a region that experienced population growth during the peak of the last glacial maximum. The Murray-Darling River Basin of southeastern Australia served as a major refuge for climate migrants during this dry period, and is the only part of the continent where the number of archaeological sites increases during the last glacial maximum. Thus, this river basin, the largest in Sahul, was similar to southern Iberia in Europe, as a region that likely received climate refugees during the cold phase. People from the surrounding areas were attracted to the Murray-Darling Basin because of its robust network of rivers and lakes fed by glacial meltwater from nearby mountains. Here, they found mussels and fish and hunted animals attracted to fresh water. Among these lake people, an interesting solution to firewood scarcity emerged. At many of their camps, they placed large stones directly into their campfires, which absorbed heat and released this warmth over a long period, extending the effectiveness of the fire. The use of heat-retaining stones became more important at times when the extent of woodlands declined. A unique insight into the life of the Murray-Darling Basin comes from the most extensive set of preserved prehistoric footprints known anywhere in the world. More than 500 human footprints made by at least 23 people have been discovered at the edge of an ancient lake bed. Here, people stepped into soft clay sometime between 23,000 and 19,000 years ago. This clay dried and was soon covered by sand, preserving these imprints and allowing us to reconstruct a moment in the life of prehistoric Australians. Of the 23 trackways, seven were made by children, ages 4 to 9, the other 16 were teenagers or adults. Based on the size of the largest footprints, 
It's estimated that the three tallest men stood more than 185 centimeters tall, more than six feet. These people did not all move in the same direction, and it's not clear if they were together at the same time. About 14 of them, including all the children, walked slowly from east to west, or in the opposite direction. They meandered, one child wandering away from the group and back again. Perpendicular to them, another group of six adult men ran north to south, parallel to each other and spaced out at regular intervals. It seems likely that these footprints capture the moment in which a group of hunters sprinted in pursuit of an animal. This interpretation is supported by the presence alongside some of the tracks of small round imprints believed to have been made by the blunt end of wooden spears. Given the absence of stone points and the rarity of bone points in Sahul during the Pleistocene, it's likely that the wood at one end of these spears had been sharpened to a point. In one spot, there was a long groove with the same width as the spears, which has been interpreted as the mark made by this weapon as it ricocheted off the ground, after having been thrown and missing its prey. It's not clear what animal these men were hunting, but their prints allow us a rare glimpse into prehistoric hunting tactics. They hunted in coordinated groups, spacing themselves out to surround and flank their prey, which they may have ambushed near a lake. In this case, they pursued their prey at high speeds, with some men reaching speeds of 30 kilometers per hour, a powerful example of the utilization of the athletic capabilities of our species on the hunt tens of thousands of years ago. Although most of Sahul has little evidence of major cultural change during the last glacial maximum, the northeast margin of this region is an exception. On the Bismarck Archipelago, 50 kilometers northeast of New Guinea, a fascinating transformation took place. At the peak of the cold, hunter-gatherer fishers of these islands became enmeshed in a network of long-distance connections that extended across the ocean. Several lines of evidence point toward the emergence of a new social dynamic. First of all, during the last glacial maximum, the people of these islands started transporting obsidian from one island to another. This glassy black volcanic stone only exists naturally on one of the islands within the Bismarck Archipelago. Before the last glacial maximum, people carried it over land within that island. But around 25,000 years ago, small quantities of obsidian appeared among the stone tools at several sites on other islands, as much as 100 kilometers from its source people had become increasingly mobile over water, making routine inter-island trips by boat. These journeys facilitated the collection and trade of this valuable raw material. In another sign of increasing ocean-going competence, groups living on the Bismarck Archipelago made increasingly challenging ocean voyages, resulting in the colonization of two new islands right before and after the last glacial maximum. To the southeast, people reached the Solomon Islands around 33,000 years ago, either by a 180-kilometer ocean crossing or several 60- to 70-kilometer trips using tiny islands as stepping stones. This new settlement represented the easternmost point of human occupation at the time. Then, around 15,000 years ago, another group traveled in the opposite direction from the Bismarck Archipelago, making a direct crossing of more than 200 kilometers over open ocean, 
to reach the small island of Manus. Both of these astounding voyages began out of sight of the land they were setting out to, an even greater challenge than crossing from Wallacea to Sahul. These journeys resulted in the first major maritime colonizations made by people in this region since the arrival in the Bismarck Archipelago more than 10,000 years earlier, and demonstrate an increase in ocean navigation capabilities. These sea crossings took daring, an understanding of ocean currents, and the ability to predict the location of distant islands. The ambition of these dispersals hints at a growing motivation to find new islands, possibly due to growing densities of people on the ones already inhabited. Support for this theory comes from the food people ate on the islands of the Bismarck Archipelago. Since these islands completely lacked large animals, people here survived on fish, mollusks, bats, lizards, and rats. But then, during the last glacial maximum, when foraging for shellfish, people started gathering smaller sea snails and a wider range of species compared to those collected thousands of years earlier. In other words, foragers were resorting to eating smaller shellfish, a sign that larger mollusks were becoming less abundant, possibly due to human population growth and over-exploitation of coastal resources. Interestingly, around 24,000 years ago, the inhabitants of these islands took a step to improve their dietary options. This measure was the translocation of an animal species from the Sahulian mainland to the Bismarck archipelago, specifically a possum-like marsupial known as a couscous, an inhabitant of the tropical rainforests of New Guinea. People had been hunting these animals on the continent for millennia, but during the last glacial maximum, the bones of these animals suddenly appeared among the refuse of several human camps on the Bismarck Islands, and remained common prey here throughout the Pleistocene. This means that groups of people crossed 60 kilometers of ocean from New Guinea to these islands carrying live animals that they had trapped. They did this enough times and with enough animals to create new wild breeding populations of couscous on the islands. We don't know whether these animals were intentionally released or escaped from their human captors. Regardless, the translocation of the couscous to the Bismarck Archipelago is one of the oldest known cases of the introduction of an exotic species by humans. Human modification of ecosystems to increase the abundance of food resources had occurred earlier in northern Sahul, where stone axes and fire had probably been used to clear patches of tropical forest. The practice of introducing staple plants and animals to the islands surrounding Sahul continued after the last glacial maximum, when the rabbit-like bandicoot and a nut-bearing tree were introduced to Manus around 15,000 years ago. The translocation of the couscous and other species supports the idea of strengthening maritime connections around the Bismarck Archipelago, possibly including the exchange of wild animals. The theory that this region experienced migrations of people around the time of the last glacial maximum is corroborated by genetic studies of modern genomes. Mitochondrial DNA sequences have revealed similarities between people living on different islands, which point to prehistoric migrations, mostly of people moving from New Guinea toward the surrounding islands. Chronological estimates for these events are vague, ranging from 30,000 to 10,000 years ago. This genetic signal is found among people living on the Bismarck and Solomon archipelagos to the east, but also in Wallacea and the Philippines to the west. In other words, not only were there secondary colonizations of the Bismarck archipelago, 
but also ocean voyages from Sahul back to Wallacea. This back migration took place 30,000 years after the original arrival in Sahul. So why were hunter-gatherer fishers of New Guinea dispersing out across the ocean in all directions? Why were they taking animals, plants, and obsidian with them as they hopped from island to island? What was this society like? And why did it emerge during the last glacial maximum? This culture, composed of confident ocean travelers and fishers, probably emerged at a time when the density of forager bands was increasing. This may have encouraged more frequent migration and stronger social connections. In addition, lower sea levels during the peak of the Ice Age may have encouraged more inter-island movement, as the distances between them were at their lowest. Unlike southern Sahul, where environmental changes mostly made human life more challenging, northern Sahul may have experienced a cultural fluorescence of a small maritime society during this period. Here, closer to the equator, aridity was not a major concern. In fact, as it got drier or colder, rainforests opened into more inviting woodlands and savannas. These conditions may have favored population growth. Whatever the explanation, the last glacial maximum was not a time of difficulty for everyone everywhere in the world. In our next episode, we will finish our exploration of the Pleistocene of Sahul and watch as new cultural practices emerged under improving environmental conditions. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider becoming a patron of the show. Your support will allow me to continue bringing you our prehistory.